Hello, I'm Bob Tribe, and this is another episode of the Valley to Vietnam Project, and today our guest is Bart Gormley. And Bart, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Uh, Bart was with the Air Force uh, from 1967 to 1971, and he was a medic. So, Bart, you started out, you were born in Seattle, which is, you have a extensive history in that state, as I understand it. Most of my relatives did. live there. Right. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, the, my great-grandfather was a governor of Washington. Oh, okay. And uh, then on my dad's side, my great-uncle was Admiral Gormley, famous uh, for his service in World War II in the Pacific until he got fired by Truman. <laughs> oh, I've heard of him, yeah. And there's there's a big big naval base I I understand in Washington, of course. I think there's a few of them on yeah, Puget Sound, several, right? Yeah. Um, so, but you didn't stay in Seattle long. You moved to Redlands, California. Yeah, my dad was a physician, and uh, I was born in Seattle. But then he went to the Mayo Clinic for his residency, and then uh, was offered a job in in Redlands. So fortunately, I got to grow up in California as opposed to Wisconsin. Ah, well, there's someone I know that doesn't think that's such a good thing. But um, you, so what's Redlands like? I, I've, you know, I've heard the name, I just don't know much about it. Well, it's about 60 miles east of LA, halfway to Palm Springs. You drive okay. through Redlands on your way to Palm Springs. Uh, it's claim to fame as it was the naval orange capital of the world. They grew more naval oranges there per acre than anywhere. Wow. And so I grew up as a kid eating naval oranges. We lived adjacent to a grove for a while and we'd go in there in the summer and just devour naval oranges. But uh, the other interesting thing about Redlands is it was very famous in the late 1800s, early 1900s as a destination, a winter destination for um, rich East Coast millionaires who came out for the weather. Oh. This is before Florida, Palm Beach, Vegas. Uh, sure. There weren't a lot of places to go, but Redlands was blessed with great weather in the winter. And so they came out there and they built these extravagant vacation homes. Victorian. Victorian, which uh, is pretty much the architectural style of Redlands to this day, other than out in the outskirts where they built subdivisions and things sure. like that. And it's a fascinating place to visit. Didn't appreciate it when I was growing up. I right. appreciate it now. So you stayed in Redlands and through high school and through all through grade school until I, you were ready to go to college. Right, and I left for college when I was 17. Okay. To University of Pacific in Stockton, and you had did you have an anticipated major, or were, like most of us, you started college not knowing what they had? I to didn't have a clue uh, what I wanted to do, which became apparent once I got there. Right. Um, I knew a lot of upperclassmen, uh -huh. so unfortunately, I was getting invited to all the parties, the fraternity parties, and I joined a band, a rock band that actually became halfway good. So spent a lot of time entertaining or being entertained. What did you play? Guitar. Okay. Still do. Do you? In fact, it was important to me in Vietnam. I'll be darned. Um, so, but you finished a year there. I finished one year and realized I was at least smart enough to realize I wasn't ready for college. I didn't know you know, what I was doing, I was spinning my wheels. So, um, at that time, if you were in college, you got a 2S deferment. I had one. And uh, if you didn't have a 2S deferment, you were 1A. And one of those was draftable, too. and a lot of people were being drafted. So, I realized I didn't want to waste any more of my parents' money, so I decided to, uh, instead of being drafted, enlist where, uh, I might be able to have control over my destiny a little more than being drafted. And given all that naval background in your family. Indeed, that, that uh, was your I was always gonna thought. go Navy. Yeah. Uh, that was my plan. At the time, the 
recruiting offices were all located in, uh, together in one building in San Bernardino. Okay. And so I jumped in the car and drove over to San Bernardino to enlist in the Navy. And I got to the building and uh, the Naval office was closed for lunch. And I didn't want to drive all the way back to Redlands, so I decided to wait for them to come back. And right. to kill time, I wandered into the Air Force recruiting office. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> so they talked you into it. Exactly. I, uh, one of my motivations was not to go to Vietnam. So I figured the Air Force was as good as the Navy for that. It's probably lucky for me that uh, the Naval recruiter wasn't there because I would have joined the Navy. And when it came time to pick a job, I would have picked Corman. Right. And at that, well, as, as we all they know, the it. Corman were the ones out in the field with the Marines. Yeah. And I have great respect for those guys. Took care of a few of them that were wounded. Um, but I joined the Air Force. Interesting. Just uh, just as an aside, we had one fellow in here. We've interviewed several Marines, but um, he told this very emotional story about his corpsman who was wounded when they were up in I Corps. And I'll tell you, I I choked up. I couldn't continue for a bit. But you're right. You would have ended up as a corpsman. They were they were amazing. Uh, one rule I, I spent. You know, in Vietnam, spent most of my time in a surgical hospital, but um, the, the thing was, when we did get out in the field, the whole idea was not to be identified as a medical right. personnel. Yeah. We carried, am carried our medical stuff in an ammo bag, uh, we carried weapons, and um, the idea was you did not want to be identified because they were particularly high on the target priority sure. list yeah, in anybody, an ambush. Anybody with an antenna, you know, the RTO is going to be hit. Anybody given handed sick, handed arm signals is denoted as a leader and they're going to be hit. So yeah, but right. medics, uh, that's true. So why don't you tell us a little bit about all your Air Force training before you Well, went I went to basic training, uh, discovered I couldn't march. My, I'm a head bobber. Oh yeah. And the DI finally figured out that I was not faking it. I really could not make my head stay level. So he decided to make me the guide on bearer for the squadron where I'd be out in front carrying the flag. Ah. But that made it worse because then the flag was going <laughs> up and down. Well maybe it was supposed to. You could always. <laughs> Yeah. So I became what they called a heat guard because it, this was in the middle of summer in San Antonio. Oh, yeah. And during drill, a lot of guys would, would faint. And my job was to run out there, drag them off the drill pad into the shade, give them salt water or give them salt tablets right. and water. And that was my job. So yeah. that was good. <laughs> but during the course of basic training, you're tested to see what your aptitude is. Right. And, uh, for some reason, I tested very high in electronic or electrical, even though I knew nothing about it. I also uh, scored a perfect score in the general category, which included intelligence and uh, medical uh, service technician. Right. And my initial thought was to go for intelligence because they said that the job would you you would be sent to Monterey to the military language school. You'd be taught a language, then you go out and work in intelligence. So I had visions of learning French and being stationed in Paris. Uh, somebody older and wiser told me, no, you'll learn an obscure Chinese dialect. You'll be stationed on the border of Mongolia somewhere monitoring radio broadcasts. That's what your job will be. Yeah. Well, that didn't appeal to me, so the next one was down was uh, medic, which I decided to go for. Admirable. Um, and the medical training is pretty extensive. I know in Special Forces, we, uh, our medics would train for nine, ten months. Um, and you took the very best of your people to be the medics. 
So. Right. Well, my my school was not that long, but it was pretty intense. It was eight hours a day, five days a week, and you'd march to and from school, and you get go through the training, and there were milestones. It, it, they test you at a certain point, and if you pass the test, the first level was three level. If you pass that, then you kept being trained. If you didn't pass it, you were shipped out somewhere. Uh, the next level was five level, and the top level was seven level, and I made it through seven level training. Okay. And uh, at that point, you got assigned. Now, was that at Lackland also, or is that someplace else? No, it was in Wichita Falls, and that's I'm a, just blanking on the that's name. Okay. I can get you the name. No, that's fine. Um, so from there, you're, once you finish the medical training, then the next step is for you to be assigned someplace. Well, I had put in for overseas assignment, uh -huh. said I wanted to be eligible for overseas placement, uh -huh. just because I had never been anywhere uh, and had led a very sheltered life. But uh, that was at the beginning of training. At the end of training, I graduated number one in my class. I had an affinity for medical stuff, so since I was number one in the class, I had first pick of overseas assignment. They had an officer there with a list of the open assignments, uh, and you could pick which one you wanted. How many of those were there? A lot? There is, my memory serves me correctly, there was about 20, 25 on the list. Wow. And uh, the bottom of the list, about 10 or 12 of them were Vietnam. The top of the list was England, uh, Germany I think was available, the Azores I remember, Alaska. <laughs> wow. And um, anyway, I at that time thought I was a pretty good medic because I graduated seven level training number one. Sure. So I decided I needed to go to Vietnam to be a medic. My fear was that in England, which is very desirable, it's a three-year hitch. Everybody wanted it, obviously. Yeah. That I would be relegated to emptying bedpans and mopping floors, whereas if I went to Vietnam, I'd actually be doing medical stuff. Yeah. And as it turned out, that I was correct in that. What I was a little naive about were the risks in a war zone. Sure. And. Uh, but I picked Vietnam and I can still remember the, it was a captain and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you realize these are all available to you? <laughs> and I said, yes sir, I want Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so you have these choices of all these different places you can go, like <laughs> pretty nice places in Europe and you pick Vietnam. Well, it seemed the, the smart thing to do if I wanted to be a medic yeah, and I wanted want. to be a good medic. Sure. So. I don't think it really dawned on me that maybe that wasn't the best decision I could have made. Yeah. Uh, as it, but as it turned out, it, in my case it was. And it also turned out that I didn't really think about the uh, danger part of it until actually the day I was leaving to fly to Vietnam. And I have a picture right. where I still remember I looked very grim because I think <laughs> I'm thinking about that. Well, I want to talk about two first days, your, your first day in Vietnam and your first day in a hospital where you're actually starting to do the, the duties. Or that, was that the same day? Or was uh, that no, days? I think they gave me 24 hours to acclimatize. That's what I figured. Uh, but they were short on medics, even shorter on physicians. Yeah. This was a surgical hospital, very like the movie MASH. Uh -huh. uh, the wards, instead of being in tents, were in Quonset huts with revetments around them. And the instead of living in tents, we lived in hooches with corrugated tin roofs. And, right. and initially, uh, no revetments, just these square plywood little buildings with screens and tin roofs. But I landed in Da Nang, and from Da Nang we were flown to Cameron. And I, we got there, in, this was February, at about 2 in the morning. And I remember stepping off the plane, initially thinking I'm going to get shot as soon as I walk off the plane. 
But shortly thereafter, I decided uh, getting shot wouldn't be my demise. It was the heat and humidity. If it's this bad at two in the morning, I can't survive this. Yeah. But uh, so that was my first thing. Then we flew down to Cameron, was assigned to my hooch, assigned to a surgical ward. Uh, and then my first day in the hospital, uh, I just, it was when I learned that practicing on rubber dummies and the things we got in training that I was very proud of are in no way equated to real life. You know? And I think the first day I was there, I still remember my first job, it was a uh, army guy had been shot through the sh shoulder, through and through wound. My job was just to irrigate the wound with a catheter and a big syringe thing. Yeah. With saline just to keep the infection out. And I found that to be, I mean, it was a little, I was a little queasy that first day. Right. But I got over that very quickly. But that was my first day, irrigating a bullet wound. Yeah. So, now, you, you mentioned when we talked earlier that you were, um, really at, at a casualty hospital, at a primary hospital, I think, and then also you said uh, you did med cap, cap duty. So well, yeah, the MASH hospital I did most of my career, but I then I transferred into a unit called 26 Casualty Staging, okay. where we did air evac, flew in Hueys, uh -huh. went out to the field to pick up patients, or sometimes just transferring patients down to Tonsonut in Saigon so you hump the litters onto a C-130 and fly down there and then fly back. But mostly it was in the Hueys. And then I had a couple of respites, um, one doing, working with an Army MedCap team. And that was one of the operations to win the hearts and minds of the people by uh, going to villages, setting up shop with an interpreter, a couple of medics, a couple of Army guys, for protection, supposedly. Yeah. Uh, we were an amphibious vehicle going up rivers to these little fishing villages. And uh, then having the villagers line up and if they had medical issues, taking care of them. If they needed soap, you give them soap. If they had a, you know, needed something lanced, we'd do that. If we found something bad, we'd try and talk them back into coming back with us for surgery. Uh -huh. They never did. Yeah. But. Um, did that for a while, and it turned out, I was a little nervous about it, but it turned out to be pretty safe duty because the VC knew what we were doing, uh -huh. and uh, basically what we were doing was supplying the VC. They would, one time, when we, we hadn't even gotten around a bend in the river and you saw them coming out of the trees, they'd collect the pills and the soap and yeah, so on. Right. So they didn't shoot at us because they didn't want to stop that. Sure. Well now, you must have performed all kinds of different procedures when you were in the hospital. Everything. What, why don't you give us a feel for what that included? Well, when I first got there, it was, uh, Tet had, the Tet Offensive of 68 had just started. Yeah, you hit that right on the nose. So we were, from almost day one, I was uh, having to deal, as were the other medics and the few physicians, with mass casualty situations. I have one vivid memory of uh, we had gotten so many in at one time that they had of the deceased guys uh, body bags outside the the Quonset hut because there was not enough room in the morgue for them. So we had body bags lined up outside and that was pretty stark. But um, sometimes you're doing easy stuff like cutting out shrapnel and sewing them up later uh, because you left the wounds open so uh, you could pump them full of antibiotics. Infection was the big problem over there. Uh, but sometimes with the mass casualties, that was pretty intense. You know, on occasion, we as medics were required, and this was the hardest thing to me, to triage. And Triaging, as you probably know, is basically deciding who's going, who you're going to work on, and who you're going to let die. Right. And you know, I'm 18, and having to make a decision like that when the guy's looking at you is very difficult. Yeah. And that's probably the one thing that still gets me. Right. 
but um, a lot of trauma uh, and uh, you have to learn how to get used to that trauma or you you know, I have a hard time yeah. psychologically. Yeah, sure. And uh, fortunately, I mean, I came up with a way of doing it. Um, I saw medics get shipped home under sedation because they couldn't deal with it. The way I dealt with it uh, was there was a senior guy getting ready to rotate back home, and he had told me, do not make friends with people you're working on because you're going to lose, lose some of them. And that's difficult if you become friends with them. So I be had to become a little callous, and I sort of compartmentalized all that to this day. Yeah. And uh, I started looking at the, at the body as a machine. The blood was oil. The uh, guts were parts. Yeah. And that's the way you just got right in there and did it. Yeah. Keep your emotions out of it. And, you know, that's the only way to do it if you're going to be efficient because sometimes, especially in mass casualties, you don't have time to go through the process. you just got to get in there and do it. I imagine there were times, too, when there was no physician available and you essentially became the physician. Exactly. We did, uh, to the, we did all the cutting and sewing of minors. My, my, when I say minor, when no major organ or system was involved. Um, shrapnel, we'd be the ones to go in, take it out, yeah. sew them back up to this day. I'll bet you I can suture better than some doctors out there because we did it all. Right. And then you had pediatricians that were working trauma that had been drafted and were not happy about it. Yeah. One of my good friends in the MASH hospital was a neurosurgeon who I still remember and uh, he was very unhappy with being drafted did not like being in the military right. and showed it. But they couldn't afford to discipline him because he was the only neurosurgeon. Right. And, uh, but, you know, there, we did a lot of things. We set bones, we put casts on, you know, we did it all. Um, there were some funny things that happened. You know, I think I mentioned to you that uh, one strange thing to me anyway is when I think of Vietnam, I don't think of the bad stuff. I think about the funny things that yeah. occurred while I was over there. And uh, there's a lot of those. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, were there, were there times when you just felt like you couldn't continue or? You no, know, you just, I was all able to deal with it. You, you build in that mental toughness and just trudge through. I didn't think of it as toughness. I just learned how to compartmentalize and I told yeah. you how I viewed it yeah, very and kept my emotions out of it and then uh, I had some releases. I One of them of that was system. playing guitar and writing songs. I've written a few songs about Vietnam yeah. but I don't want it, I never wanted them to be identified as Vietnam songs. So for example a very close friend of mine, a medic, black kid from Chicago, uh, Herman Harrison if I can say his name, died a month before we were due to leave. Uh -huh. And that got to me because he was a friend. Yeah. And sure. we had talked about, you know, we'd be on, as you know, in Vietnam, you're going to be on the same plane as the guys that make it through that you went over with. Mm -hmm. And we had planned to do all this stuff, and he died <coughs> suddenly. So I wrote a song about him, not about how unfair him getting uh, killed in Vietnam was but rather the last conversation I had with him. So when I play that song, I know what it's about, but yeah. somebody listening to it wouldn't get that. Right. Wow. <laughs> um, so you were there for a full year, and you, uh, you leave in February of 69 then. Yeah. Back to the States. Yeah. I wanted to mention one thing about oh, sure, that Nash Hospital. Yeah. You know, you had asked me about my first day. Yeah. Maybe in my second week there, I had my first, I was doing dressing changes and irrigations and stuff like that, but then I was, they wanted me to start doing cutting and sewing. Uh -huh. So the first suture job I had was on a Marine uh, who looked like he was, I think he was on his second tour. He'd been around. Right. 
And he had a shrapnel wound in his forearm that, you know, about four or five inches. Nothing. Easy to, to do. But it was my first one for real. Yeah. And I remember, uh, you know, gloving up and having the sterile suture package. And the way we did it back then is we had these glass three ring syringes. And we would use those to inject the xylocaine into the wound to numb them. But to draw it out of the bottle, you wanted a big needle, big fat needle, because it would come out more quickly. So you use an 18 gauge needle and you draw it out and you take the needle off, put a fine needle on there to do the injecting. But what I forgot, because I was nervous, um, and this guy's just staring at me, <laughs> is that these needles, you put them on and you twist them and they lock. So they won't come, inadvertently come off. So I withdrew the xylocaine, I'm moving to remove the 18 gauge needle. And I didn't twist it, I'm just tugging on it. Tugging, tugging, and it's hot and humid. And all of a sudden my fingers slip and I rebound and then fire back, rebound reaction, and drove the needle right through my hand. Oh my gosh. And my glove is filling up with blood, and this Marine is just laying there looking at me. Can I get another medic, please? No, he just said, first time, Doc. <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of the stuff. Wow. And then there, you know, there, you know, one way we kept our sanity over there was pranks. And yeah. the medics were the king of the pranks. Sure. And I may have mentioned to you the, uh, the infamous speaker prank, squadron speaker prank. This is when Hot Lips was with Majors. No, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> well, you remember in MASH, in the movie, uh, there was a boardwalk yeah. in the squadron where they lived. Right. And then there were posts with loudspeakers, and the squadron commander or radar would broadcast information periodically. Uh -huh. We had the exact same setup. Yeah. And uh, one of the peculiarities of being in Cameron Bay was um, that we had a PX, and the PX was getting top of the line electronics equipment from Japan with no duty and no tax. So you could buy the uh, buy a stereo system that was the envy of anyone right. for peanuts, and we had nothing to spend our money on anyway. So we get these systems, and our hooch I think had one electrical outlet. And so we had this system set up, so we listened to good music. One day somebody thought it would be funny to, in the dead of night, wire our system, which we had, we had built an attic and we kept it up there, uh, wire it to the loudspeaker right outside our hooch and tie into the whole speaker system, which was done. And at two in the morning, a few nights later, opened up with some very loud rock and roll, which was lock, oh, like watching killer bees leave the hive <laughs> of mostly lifers running around trying to figure out what had happened. Right. And uh, never got caught for that one. Good. But that, you know, that was the kind of stuff you did. So it, was, it wasn't too different from MASH in a way. No. Uh, and then 26 casually staging, that was quite a bit different. I learned early on that Hueys don't have armor. Yeah. And that when, the, when you're flying over the VC, they like to shoot. And had taken care of a couple of guys that had been shot right up the rear end, sitting in a Huey while it yeah. was flying. So I, uh, when I got assigned to 26 casualty staging, I immediately went looking for a piece of armor plating. And I found a square piece, about an inch and a half thick, and I used to lug this each time I was going out on the helicopter. I'd lug it to the helicopter and put it down and sit on it. You know, I, I know a lot of the infantry guys sat on their armored vests when they were in helicopters. Exactly. So, um, so anyway, you eventually, after a year of this, come back to the States and should have gotten your um, choice of any place you wanted to go. That's correct. Uh, when I had volunteered, the guy told me, well, at least you'll get your assignment of choice on, on return. Uh -huh. So I put in for California, being from California, and 
two of my fr friends that were the same rank. By this time, I was sergeant. That's one thing about Vietnam. It was good for for promotions for and sure. for ribbons. Yeah. And um, two of my friends, both from Texas, both sergeants, put in for Texas. Well, naturally, they both got California, and I got Abilene, Texas. Right. That's the way the system works sometimes. And I really was upset about that, so I went storming into the squadron commander, and he said, Sergeant, it's level of training, it's not rank. Huh? And that's where my seven level of training betrayed me, because these other two guys had five level training, and the job in Abilene called for seven level. So there I was. You know, pretty amazing, a rational decision made in the service. I didn't see a lot of those. But, <laughs> um, so what were you doing then in Abilene? Well, I arrived, I don't know if you've ever been to Abilene, but no, don't bother. <laughs> yeah. um, I just was still upset about it. And so I was reporting in to the, to the big hospital there. And um, the, Hospital commander and the first sergeant were trying to, do, were talking about somebody, they needed to find somebody for a temporary duty assignment in uh, Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana. And I went, what about me? Because I knew I was going to hate Abilene, so I figured anything I could do to lessen the time there would be good. So I went, uh, spent six months in Shreveport, Louisiana. Then I came, had to go back to Abilene, and um, this was more military-like. Here I am, a medic from Vietnam, trauma experience, complete trauma experience. They put me on the OBGYN ward <laughs> for uh, the wives of uh, the people on base. And, you know, these dependents, um, what was interesting there was, in Vietnam, I had actually delivered two babies, two Vietnamese babies uh -huh. that were brought into our aid station. And, you know, it was an amazing experience to deliver a baby until they went into labor. Uh -huh. Not a peep during labor. You deliver the baby, it's easy, easy, and, you know, they're back at work a few days later. Right. Not so when I got to the OBGYN ward at in Abilene, Texas. Yeah. So I started petitioning the uh, hospital commander that I really needed to be in the emergency department. That's where I was comfortable and finally got to do that. Oh, and eventually he was a staff sergeant and was in charge of a ER shift until I got out. Didn't you also um, offer to go back to Vietnam? <laughs> that was my second uh, plan was when I came back from Shreveport, I volunteered for Vietnam again, and they wouldn't allow it. They oh boy. said, "Did you have a year left?" Oh, I had two years left. Okay. So um, they said no. Nobody. I think they were thinking nobody in their right mind would go back to Vietnam. Right. My theory was, if I'm going to be miserable, yeah, uh, why not get paid extra for it? Yeah. Because you know we got hazardous duty and combat pay. It's so much easier to save money over in Vietnam. So. Well, you know, my life in Vietnam was, you know, had its idiosyncrasies that made it pretty tough, but not nearly as tough as the guys that were out in the field. Yeah. And, um, you know, I appreciated every day what they were doing. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, we were hit with, you know, what we had to worry about where I was was rockets and mortar attacks. Yeah, sure. So, you finally get out of the service in 1971. That's correct. Yeah, and you decided you were ready for college now and you had the GI Bill. Uh, that is one thing the military will do for you. Yeah. You know, I learned early on that it was better to be an officer than an enlisted guy. And in the Air Force anyway, you had to have a college degree to be an officer. Uh, and the idea of going to college after what I'd been through seemed pretty attractive. And um, so I went back to college, actually in my hometown, it has a small college there that's got a good academic reputation. And um, I went back as a biology major pre-med. Oh, okay. 
That was what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be a surgeon because what Vietnam taught me was the idea of being presented with a problem, using your hands to fix the problem, problem over, appealed to me more than medicine where, because we had in Vietnam a lot of exotic diseases, they actually scared me more than getting killed by a bullet or a, right. or a rocket. Um, there were some pretty scary ones. But with those, you have to treat them with medicine. It's a long course. And I just like the, uh, the speed and the finality of a surgical fix. Was your father a surgeon? He was. Yeah. Um, and when I went back to college, I also worked um, three to four shifts a week at the local hospital in the emergency room. Oh. And uh, I enjoyed that because it was, especially when there was trauma because that's what I had done. Sure. And um, so I, it was easy to get a job doing that. But I wanted to be a surgeon. So you did that. Once, once you graduated from Redlands, you decided to get a master's degree. No. Uh, well, I got to tell you why I went for the master's degree and not medical school. Okay. I did pre-med for a year and a half and was doing well in it. I liked the science. But uh, I was in a biology lab one day, and my classmates all were a few years younger than I was because I'd been in the military. And I had an epiphany. I started counting how many years it was going to be to become a surgeon. And uh, it was longer than I realized initially. I hadn't right. thought about that. But, you know, I did uh, finished uh, three and a half years that I had to do of college in three years. Then you got four years of medical school, then a five-year surgical residency. Then if you want to be uh, any good at all, you do uh, a fellowship. So that's two more years. And I decided I couldn't wait that long to earn a living. Right. So I dropped out of pre-med, became an English major just to get through the, have a major to graduate with but didn't want to be a teacher, so I immediately got, went to get a master's degree, and it turned out to be in health administration and planning. That's it, that was at the University of Colorado? University of Colorado Medical Center, yes. Yeah. Um, so now you're in your, that sort of career, and, and uh, you talked to me, you were in the same field for many years. Well, what I did, I, when I made that switch, uh, I wanted to be a medical group administrator. Like my dad was in a big medical group in Redlands. Uh -huh. I was friends with the administrator and I liked the concept of medical groups, multi-specialty medical groups. And so that's what I focused on and that's what I ended up doing for well over 30 years until I finally got burned out on it. And then you switched to something Kind of related. related. Um, yeah. I joined a national, very large national insurance company that uh, provides insurance for physicians. Okay. And initially was doing sales where I'd talk to the doctors and try and get them to buy our insurance uh -huh. and uh, enjoyed that. And now I work with all our agents in California, keeping them productive. Okay. Well, um, I guess as a sort of summary, I mean, I just ask, how, how do you feel that Vietnam changed you? Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, it definitely changed me. Um, I think you had asked me, uh, or the questioner asked if we had participated in any peace demonstrations. Oh, sure. I never did. Even though in Vietnam we wore peace symbols and beads, uh, but it, I didn't join any demonstrations. However, upon return, I uh, flew into San Francisco. I had had a girlfriend when I was at UOP that I had encouraged to go to Cal because she was so smart, see if she could get a scholarship, and she did. So I decided to hitchhike to uh, Berkeley to see her. Uh -huh although she was very unhappy with me when I enlisted and when I went to Vietnam, uh, sort of lost contact with her. Right. 
And uh, I got to Berkeley just as a giant demonstration was going on. There were helicopters, there were tear gas, there were thousands of students and hundreds of police. And uh, even though I was in civilian clothes, I was obviously military and was getting some bad remarks from some of the demonstrators. So I just got out of there. Yeah. Um, there were some things initially, actually to this day hold true that I noticed. Uh, when I went back to college, I was very uncomfortable having people behind me. And I, every class I had, I took a seat in a corner with walls behind me. I was just more comfortable that way. Yeah. And to this day, I'm more comfortable with nobody behind me. I don't quite that is. The other thing that made me nervous was were firecrackers, like ladyfingers. It sounds too much like automatic weapons. Yeah. And so I don't jump at it anymore, but I, I really did for a few years after, after Vietnam. Yeah. But um, I used to think I'd start reading about post-traumatic stress and uh, said, well, I don't have any of that. And yeah, I was smart enough to compartmentalize all that stuff, so I never had any of that. However, I did note that I had developed a lot of residual anger, sort of not about anything specific, but just sort of angry. Right. And um, that probably was due to Vietnam because I hadn't been that way prior. Sure. But uh, fortunately for me, I discovered rugby. Oh. <laughs> and um, if you are familiar with rugby, it's very physical. Uh, there's a lot of contact. I grew up not being allowed to play any contact sports because my parents didn't want us to get hurt. I played tennis and was pretty a very good tennis player. As, as a matter of fact, Redlands is a te big tennis town. But this was before tennis became cool. So you know, we're, the, we're in the CIF finals for tennis for the whole state and no girls are coming to watch us. <laughs> so, um, when I discovered rugby, uh, once I played in a game, I knew I had found something. Um, and you know, you get the, you go into a game angry, and you know you have this stuff sort of boiling around in your brain, and you finish a game, and all that's gone. So I played rugby for over thirty years, wow. and I credit it for keeping me on the on an even plane. Well, you're no longer sheltered, that's for sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bart, I just want to thank you for coming in today. Um, that's a great story. And, uh, oh, you're welcome. You should be proud of yourself. I'm proud of you. So thank you thank very you. much for your service. Thank you for yours. And that ends this episode of Valley to Vietnam. Be sure and be with us uh, next time. Thank you.